All right, coming up on this edition of the Penn State Blitz on Penn Live, Tommy Stevens is out. We've got to talk about that. We've got to talk about the new quarterback, Sean Clifford. We're going to see if there's any other Penn State surprises coming. And then, of course, we're going to get to the Penn State mailbag. Okay, Greg Pickle, I don't know if you're aware, but behind me there he is. Is, is the looming presence of a former Penn State quarterback, Tommy Stevens. We just talked last week about maybe what he was going to do, who right. was going to be the quarterback, and literally, I think, eight seconds after we were done taping, mm -hmm. uh, comes the news that he's going into the transfer portal. Uh, clearly, probably not happy. He and his family were not happy with maybe what James Franklin laid out for Tommy with regard to his uh, maybe future at Penn State. Um, I think a lot of that might have to do with the fact that he was not healthy for a long time and Sean Clifford is a quarterback they really like. But I would say that a lot of people are, are stunned about this. I, I was surprised. I kind of thought that Sean had made up some ground. Yeah. But how do you look at it? Yeah, I think obviously when we talked last week at this time, it was clear that things didn't go well during Tommy's exit interview. His dad has since come out, Tom Stevens, and said that, you know, I don't know if he threw gas on the fire, but it certainly made it sound like maybe he felt like Penn State misled it, him and the family, or, or something along those lines. I mean, at the end of the day, I think it's pretty cut and dry, and I think you agree that they told him that Sean Clifford was still in a competition for this job, that the competition wasn't over, and yeah. I don't know if that sat all that well. His, they, they, the talk is about the NFL, the NFL, the NFL. That's fine. I understand that if you don't play, you're not going to go to the NFL, right. especially after you sat. I think the other thing there, too, is you sat behind Trace McSorley, a guy that I think we both think he should get drafted. I yeah. don't know if that means he's going to get drafted. And if you sit behind a guy that doesn't go to the pros, what does that mean then for your pro stock? So I don't know. I guess all those things meld it together and force him to look somewhere else. I just don't know where the, the grass is greener at this point in time. Yeah, before we get to that, um, just the way that James Franklin uh, maybe handled the situation, you could interpret it a lot of different ways. Obviously, the Stevens were not thrilled. I think James has talked about at the end of spring, he sits down with every player, right. and, he, and he said he's, he always has honest conversations with them, what they did right, what they did wrong, um, maybe what their role might be moving forward, anything to do with medical issues. I think he puts it all out on the table in kind of one-on-one -on -one interviews. And my question is, do you think, Greg, that maybe uh, James Franklin probably could have done, be doing Tommy Stevens a favor? He, you know, he could have said what he said at the start of spring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Tommy's won, Sean's right there, and we'll see how it plays out. I mean, if he said you know, in so many words that, hey, it's, it's a really even playing field, or right. Sean's made great strides. I mean, he, if he said that to Tommy, did he do him a favor rather than say, Tom, well, you're my guy going into, into August camp if you're healthy. There's no question. I mean, I think, and you can even, I think the family and some close to Tommy and those in Tommy's camp might look at it two ways. One being, well, who knows, well, we don't know what was said to Tommy Stevens this time last spring, yeah. this time last fall. Obviously, you know, things could have been promised. I don't know if they were, but it's possible. But at the end of the day, yeah, I mean, and his dad said as much. You can't leave, if you're not the starter uh, the third week of August with Idaho, getting ready to pound mm. in the Beaver Stadium. You can't all of a sudden leave and go find somewhere to start. Right. So you have to make that choice. If you're going to do it, you probably should have made it before spring practice started, but you certainly have to do it now. Yeah, and, and you just wonder maybe the two springs ago he could have left. Right. And it, what do you have left if he was healthy? It, it, yeah, and that's, that, that's the one thing is that he was never really healthy. I think, I think James Franklin made the only decision he could, and that said, look, you know, we can't the, – the expectation, you, you've missed a lot of time. Mm -hmm. There's going to be some rust. Um, we got we got to make it an even playing field. If you beat him out, you beat him out, and that's not I don't think what Tommy wanted to hear. So the only other thing to discuss is maybe where you see Tommy fitting in, maybe in in the fall. Yeah, I mean obviously a handful of schools have popped up as potentials: Rutgers, Illinois, Indiana. I believe USF might be looking for a quarterback. But again, at the end of the day, and this goes back to some of the questions about will Penn State take a transfer quarterback? Yeah. You, there's a Tommy Stevens at every program across the country yeah. who thinks the quarterback job either will be his or should be his. And when you bring in Tommy Stevens, you disrupt your locker room. Not that he's a bad teammate mm -hmm. or that he would blow up a locker room, but just you have guys in that locker room, who should, Penn State's locker room, who probably think Tommy Stevens should get the job. You have guys in locker rooms across the country who think that the guy that's there should be the winning, the winning uh, starting right. quarterback. 
And if Tommy Stevens comes in, and I don't think he's going to go somewhere, and, but I don't think he's going to go somewhere that he doesn't think he can win the job, but that presents its own problem. So I don't know. It'll be interesting to see. Do you think at the end of whenever he gets done taking visits and having conversations, do you think that Tommy would consider uh, mo- moving to a, a, a high-profile program at a lower level, at a, at a FCS school, I don't, maybe caters to his talents? I don't think it can be ruled out at this point. I mean, and Indiana State comes to mind. They've had some success. Um, Obviously, there's some schools around here at the FCS level. Delaware is the one that always comes to mind for Penn State quarterbacks. They've mm-hmm. had some success. Uh, Devlin. Fordham has had some success, I might add. Um, you know, I know that the fun thing to do is say that Mississippi State needs a quarterback, but I don't know if I see that marriage taking place. So, Well, you go all the way down to Starkville and it doesn't work out, man. There's no, right. there's no coming back from that. So we'll see. I mean, I don't think it can be ruled out. Do I think it's the most likely outcome? No. Do I think it's possible? Yeah, definitely. And if he, let's say he goes to a Big Ten school that Penn State plays, it would make great. it all the more intriguing. He's still got to win the job. I think we've I think we've done our due diligence with Tommy, and we've we talked about him enough. It's time to talk about Sean Clifford. Yep, he's going to be the guy if he's if he's healthy. Um, what do you like about him? And when did you kind of start to maybe get the feeling that Penn State's coaching staff was really really starting to figure out that he might be the guy. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you go back all the way to the recruiting process, the class of 2017, and that's one thing I think that bothers me about the way Sean Clifford as a starting quarterback has been viewed by some is that there's a belief that he can't fit into Ricky Ronnie's offense, which, right. of course, is Joe Moorhead's offense. Who do you think recruited him to State College? Joe right. Moorhead, James Franklin, and Ricky Ronnie. So there's no surprises here. And I know James Franklin said this before the Steven stuff came out that yeah. Clifford has become more explosive, more of a runner. He's, I don't think he's ever going to have the foot speed of Tommy Stevens or Trace McSorley. I don't think he's ever going to say, huh, yeah, there's a guy open for a three-yard dump. Let me run for five yards instead. I don't think that's how he is. If he needs to do it, he will. Mm-hmm. But to me, he's going to be a little bit more of a guy who's willing to stay in there and take a hit. Not that Trace wasn't, but I think he'll be a little bit more willing to stay in there and take a hit as opposed to maybe <laughs> sometimes Trace said, I can take off and probably get you know, 10, 15 yards. Mm-hmm. I think Sean's more likely to say, I can stand here and maybe throw for 10, 15 yards. That makes sense. Yeah, and I think Sean is more of a pass-first guy. He's talked yeah. about that. I think Tommy was more of a run-first guy. He needed to kind of... At least from what we saw. He needed to kind of go the other way. I, I don't know that he had made that transition. We don't know because he wasn't very healthy. You know, really the last time I can remember seeing Tommy Stevens in an effective role uh, was in that Maryland romp uh, in the end of 2017 when he was yeah. in a backup role. He ran for 100 yards and three touchdowns. Uh, for me, uh, with Sean Clifford, when he really first... Uh, when I, that throw he made to Daniel George, it doesn't sound like much because it was right. against, you know, uh, it was against State. Penn State, 95 yards. But if you look at, if you go back and look at that, the pump fake and everything that went with it, mm-hmm. hit him right, hit him right in stride. Even one of his incompletions in the bowl game, he put it right on Tompkins' hands, right, and he, the, the kid just dropped it. I just think he is an accurate passer, and if you're going to try and jump start this, if you're going to try and jump start this passing game, I think he, I think you want to go with a guy who could put the ball into a tight window. I think it is Sean Clifford. And we could talk a little bit more about Will Levis on another uh, episode of the Penn State Blitz, but we need to talk about, is this the last surprise we're going to be yeah. talking about between now and the season opener? Because I'm not sure. I, what what kind of, coming out of spring, did you feel like there were a couple people that maybe should be a little bit nervous? You know, I, I, I'll be curious to see, you know, Mark Brennan from 247 Sports had the photo of John Holland in street clothes. I don't know what his future is with the Penn State football party. He's still on the roster. He's still enrolled. But if you're at the Blue White game in street clothes, I just don't know exactly what that means for your future. Are there some other guys? I mean, I do think that the blessing and the curse of the transfer portal, and maybe it won't be like this every year, but if guys are going to leave, they're almost always going to leave in January and February because they want to get somewhere like Juwan Johnson, perfect example, out in Oregon for their spring game and some of their spring practice. I mean... If you're going to transfer, that's the goal. If Tommy Stevens could have done that, he probably would have because, obviously, the longer you're there, the more likely you are to be able to crack the rotation. That's why, you know, you look at the receiver room, they're bringing in two grad transfers, George Campbell, Weston Carr. Are those guys going to be able to crack the rotation right away? I don't know because they won't get here until June. Uh, two things that kind of struck me coming out of spring. One is Shane Simmons. I just, you know, again, in, on the sidelines, didn't play right. in the blue-white game, didn't hear or see a lot about him uh, during spring practice. Yeah. Greg, he really looks like he's a talented player, but I, I, he spent so much time, you know, on the sidelines or in the shop with dealing with injuries. I just wonder what the role will be for him, or will he, will he ever? 
be able to play a full season. I think right. that's one question. And one other question, it just it just sticks with me because we're all kind of waiting for Justin Shorter yeah. to, to, to kind of grab the bull by the horns and become, you know, a featured performer. Chris Godwin uh, developed very late his true freshman year and then his sophomore year. Um, in uh, 2015, mm-hmm. he was 1,100-yard receiver. Right. We still keep hearing about Justin Shorter. And then at the end of spring practice, James Franklin kind of takes a little bit of a shot at him, I thought, about his weight. He was joking, but I think J- James is trying to send Justin a message. And I'm just wondering if he would like to see – Justin was at about 232. Mm-hmm. If he wants to see him more like in the low 220s um, because I think that maybe at a lighter weight he could be more of a weapon. Those are the two guys that I think that really – I'm kind of waiting to see what's going to happen with them. Do you agree or disagree with any of that? No, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think Shane Simmons in particular. I think it was shorter. This is it, it's certainly not a make or break year for him, but he was number one receiver in the country, Bob. And I know he was hurt last year, and that slowed down his progress. Right. But he, fairly or unfairly, the bar is set really high when you come in as a five-star and the number one player in uh, at your position yeah. and Micah Parsons and Ricky Slade were two guys also in that conversation at their position made an impact already yeah. so I think it's a big year for Shorter and then with Simmons he was highly touted but he knew it was going to take him a little bit to put some weight on has he been able to and will he be healthy enough to play that's the key so we'll have to wait and see all right before we wrap it up it's time for the mailbag I'm, I have a funny feeling there's going to be at least one quarterback question prove me wrong I will prove you wrong one quick note Nick Dawkins the three-star oh, guard yeah. from Allentown committed to Penn State. Mm-hmm. I didn't have that in our talking points because it happened after the fact. A little bit of behind the scenes there. But get yeah, it together, so pickle. Just ninth get commit it together. in the class of 2020. Uh, you know, a guy that really Tennessee offered first, and then his FBS high yeah. level FBS offers started to flow in. Uh, they were able to see the deal. Golden Latumba is the other guard in this class. Uh, Grant Tutans to tackle, and uh, R.J. Adams who committed to Blue White game. So they're starting to fill up at guard and, and center. I think you'll see a couple more tackles, but. Uh, that's our recruiting segment you, for today. Do you remember Daryl Dawkins at all? Is he even on your radar? Have, you, does, does have I seen him? Bell? Have I seen the YouTube clips? Yeah, certainly. Yeah. Uh, not much more than that. He never met a, 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 a backboard he couldn't shatter, I'll tell right. you that. Um, so he was a heck of a player. So obviously this is a big athlete that can move like his dad. Penn State got themselves quite a player. Okay, mailbag me. Mailbag, okay. Um, Penn State. In January, February, was considered a top, and I think we talked about this last week, but now we have to talk about it again. They're considered a top 15 program at, you know, the moments after the Citrus Bowl ended. Yeah. Does it change? And and I guess sort of in tandem with that, this is a team that looks like it'll be favored in nine games this Mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. Is that number now lower because of Sean Clifford? Or does it not change because how much more do we know about Sean Clifford than we did Tommy Stevens and vice versa? Yeah, so top 15 to me, I would say, considering some of the people they lost, not even including Tommy Stevens, I think it's a little, I, don't, I think they're right on the cusp there. The thing that keeps uh, resonating with me is that since James Franklin has, has arrived, I think I have my math right, um, against Michigan State, Ohio State, and Michigan combined, I think he's 3-12. That's about right. Um, they beat Michigan in 2017, they beat Ohio State in 2016. And they've only beaten Michigan State once. Mm-hmm. I think that was also in 2016. They've, they've played some close games, but when you're 3-12 and 12 against the, the perceived other best teams in your conference, it's right. hard to make a case <clears throat> for them to be a top 15 team. You know, looking at their schedule, um, they got to play at Ohio State this year, um, and they got to play at Michigan State. Uh, I, I don't necessarily know that the, the quarterback shakeup is, is going to really impact that in a negative way. It right. could impact it in a positive way, but they have a lot of players that need to step up and their special teams have to get better. I think top 15 is is just about right. Best case. All right, we're going to do a separate NFL draft video, but there's not a Q&A in that, so there is in this edition of the Blitz. So Don't try and intimidate me. Oh, there's no intimidation involved. Uh, your thought now, we have a lot of information, more than we had yeah. the last time I asked you this question. Which is the first Penn State player off the board? I think the safest Penn State pick uh, will be Connor McGovern, mm-hmm. but I think there's going to be some teams that are either in need or feel like they're one one piece away that might uh, take Miles Sanders before they take Connor McGovern. Miles Sanders is a, is, a, is a running back that I think, you know, when the draft process started, when he yeah. declared, you know, right outside the top five in terms of running backs, maybe six, seven, somewhere in there. You look at what he did at the scouting combine. 
You look at what he's been able to show teams he can do in the passing game. They watched the tape of him when his one, when, in his one year and how productive he was. Um, you note the fact he doesn't have a lot of wear and tear on his body. I don't see how Miles Sanders makes it out of the second round, and I could see a team targeting him as a top 50 player. And I'm going to give you, I, I'll give you three, I'll give you three teams right now. All right. It's going to be one of these three. Okay. You're, are you, are you going to remember this? The Buffalo Bills, the Chicago Bears, or the Tampa Bay Bucks. Those are my three for Miles. Okay. I'll take the Eagles. They get Miles. Did they not just get Jordan Howard? Yeah, they did. Okay. Yeah. We'll All right. see. All right. Last question, Bob. Uh, to wrap up the Penn State Blitz. Will Micah Parsons go two for two in terms of leading Penn State in tackles? Or will teams maybe scheme away from him and lead somebody else to the top of the list? When you consider he didn't really start last year and led the team in tackles, and now he's going to start. Right. <clears throat> I would, I'm going to pencil Michael, Micah Parsons in for 110 tackles this year. Okay. And 10 tackles for loss, four forced fumbles, and six sacks. Okay, you better chop that up, Mark. That'll be like the Virginia College Basketball Championship if I, pick. If I nail this one, I'll <laughs> never stop floating. <clears throat> All right, I think that's a wrap for yep. this week's edition of a very action-packed, newsworthy uh, Penn State Blitz. Hopefully, when we come back to talk to you guys next time, Penn State will not have lost another quarterback, but you never know. <laughs>